morning. So I'm not going to spend much time talking about that this morning or afternoon, but uh, I think one of the fundamental questions that most anybody would do after listening to him talk is ask yourself, well, what can we do about that? So I'm going to try and focus mostly on that, and I'm going to try to uh, leave plenty of time for questions, because it may be that the things that you're interested in have nothing to do with what I'm going to tell you, and uh, I want to make sure that there's a chance for other topics uh, that might be related to land use development or community development to be uh, uh, talked about during my, my time slot. Uh, in a real brief overview, I'm going to talk about observations that I've made while I've been working out in Western North Dakota for the last couple of years about impacts, uh, practices that we commonly see, and resource needs that I think are really evident. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some concepts. Um, maybe most of those things are tools. I'm going to use some terms that may not be familiar to you that I'd like you to start to put into your mind. And talking just a little bit about some procedures and maybe even some warnings about what to try to avoid doing when you're dealing with land use and community growth. So, just to go back and talk again about what we observe, uh, trucks, trucks everywhere. Speeding, slow, filling, stopping, uh, uh, more than I could have ever imagined. I grew up on a farm, and great story about, you know, what you used to see going to town, maybe you pass one neighbor, and that's it. That's what I'm used to seeing. It's not what I see when I'm working out here now. And housing, just a couple issues, lots of people. But I don't think if they're from 35 other states, really get used to the idea of North Dakota winters. It's not how I spend my winters living in a camper. Or trying to makeshift things to get through the winter because I have no place else to live. So as a community or a county, the issue of housing is really a critical one. And I think Greg spent a little bit of time and maybe uh, the presentation that Kathy did beforehand also spent a little bit of time talking about how uh, the housing market changes. Um, I'm going to skip all the rest of that stuff that I could talk about and just move on to ask you to think with me about how people make decisions in your community. First of all, uh, if you have a land use decision to be made, how many of them do you typically make in a year? Uh, the numbers I have here represent the numbers that Dunn County made uh, just a year or two ago. Less than 20 decisions in a year. They met four times during that year to make those less than 20 decisions. Now this past year, they were meeting every month and they were averaging over 20 decisions per month. Orders of magnitude of growth <laughs> opportunities, of growth decisions that needed to be made and are still going to be need to be made probably in even greater numbers this coming year. So let's go back and think about how you make decisions again. Most of the time what you're used to thinking and doing is basically the Hanson approach. You know, you make an agreement, you know what you have in mind, you, you think you both understand the same thing and that's good enough for you. In this new situation, that's not good enough. We need to be crossing all the I's and dotting all the T's, making sure that everything's in black and white. Many of your communities probably have zoning regulations. Some people may think you have zoning regulations and come to find out that they were never really formally adopted. In order to have a, an ordinance that's uh, going to work for you in the coming uh, months, years, as development approaches, you probably need to dust off the ordinance and find out what it really says and what it's good for in terms of addressing the issues that Greg's been talking about this morning. Thinking about decision making again. How do you usually make decisions? You don't have a lot of them coming up at the same time, so you look at them case by case and you just do what you think is best. But if you've got 20 of them to be made every month, there's all kinds of room for inconsistency to creep in. So one of the things you probably want to do is make sure you start developing checklists and some guidelines 
And they're going to make sure you are consistent when you do make decisions based on similar requests. And then I think a lot of times we're used to being very informal about our minutes and our documentation. And uh, so you may make a decision, and at the time you knew why you made it. But five years down the road, is anybody else going to know why you made it? If you ever end up in a court, only the information that's been documented in your decision meetings are going to be able to be used in the court. So document. Document everything. Say again? And date it. And date it, yes. Uh, just some questions. When you start thinking about what your community might need, and you're starting to think about uh, potential for growth, ask these questions. What can our infrastructure support? If, if this proposition or proposal gets added to our community, what will we have available after it's in place? Can we serve for more, or are we going to be running out of water or sewer treatment capacity? Or will there be any open lots still available for somebody to build a house on, etc.? But it's not just is there capacity, it's also the question of are we making sure that those kinds of potential growth uh, developments are happening in the best spot? One of the things that's most frustrating to me is to see where a community has basically made a decision that closes the door on future growth opportunities. Maybe they uh, figured, well, nobody's going to move this direction, so we're just going to have a cul-de-sac out here and we'll build houses all the way around it. And you can't extend that street without tearing out a house or two. Uh, and then, are we allowing opportunity for future growth in other ways? Uh, not just roads, but uh, just, just in terms of capacity. You know, if we're going to have to spend some money on a sewer system upgrade, and the replacement is a, a, a six-inch pipe, but the direction that the sewer system could be going suggests there could be a lot more housing or development out there. Maybe you should upgrade that pipe to eight inches. And then, how can we use this to build for the long term? This is one of the things I've been encouraging all the communities I've been working in to do. Yes, there's some negatives. Yes, there's some positives. But ultimately, the oil, at least development phase, is going to leave. And you're going to be left with the production phase, which is going to be a lower level of activity. But it's also going to leave you with the more permanent level of activity in your community. So what can you do to build for that level of development that's going to serve your community well? Can you take advantage of the fact that you have to do some upgrades to streets or sewer and water so that they're uh, paid for uh, for the next 50 or 60 years? So I, I mentioned that, uh, that I wanted to spend most of my time talking about tools and, and, and things that we might be able to do to help address the impacts that we were talking about earlier today. And each of these, in my, my mind, are a tool. And uh, I'm going to get into them a little bit more detail later on, so I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, but think about the fact that you don't just have zoning regulations, you don't just have plans that you need, but you need to be thinking about what your community's vision for itself is. A zoning ordinance is really supposed to be a set of rules that help to maintain the values of your community. And that's kind of a strange way of thinking about it that's more often thought about as the plan. But the plan really is the uh, embodiment of the, uh, the, uh, the ideas that you want to have your community uh, grow into, its policies, and so on. And the, the rules are what the ordinances are there to help make the policies happen. Um, I'm going to try and move quickly here. Uh, one of the things I started noticing is that in oil country, people want everything done yesterday. And that's not always in your community or county's best interest. Taking the time to prepare those tools may mean saying no, or at least not yet. And I'd like to encourage all of you to not be afraid of saying not yet, or no, until you have the tools in place to manage the growth that you need. And one of the tools I mentioned on the previous page was actually a, a moratorium. 
Um, if you've been reading the newspaper lately, you know that several counties have put in the moratoriums of some things in, in place. Glen Ellen put a moratorium in place not so long ago. But ultimately, uh, when you do that, what you're doing is you're giving yourself some time to think about the pros and cons instead of just what's right in front of your face where you feel like you have to make a decision immediately. Um, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that a lot of times people who are involved in uh, land use management uh, in western North Dakota and small towns in general don't have formal training. You, you can't afford to have somebody who's got a college degree come in and try and uh, run your program for you. So you hire people who are intelligent and, and willing to, uh, to serve their communities uh, to do one job and when, when it happens that uh, you start to have some zoning issues, you ask somebody who's probably already working uh, for your community to help with that, the sort of the staff person. But eventually what happens is you have so much going on that they're overwhelmed and they can't do the two or three jobs that they were originally hired to do plus the planning and zoning. And then they need to get a better understanding about the technical aspects of doing their job. And that means you need to be prepared to help them with some training. Um, sometimes it's just maybe some written resources, but I think a lot of times it's actually going to some seminars to get some detailed training. And then finally, I uh, just want to make a point about the importance of recognizing that whether it's the, uh, the ambulance squad, the fire chief, the deputies, uh, your county recorder's office, or the planning and zoning people, all of them are going to see huge upticks in their workload, and with that comes the potential for burnout. If they're good people, you want to keep them. So think about how you can try to manage that issue of the potential for burnout. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and spend a little time talking about some detailed uh, points of land use planning. Um, the first thing I want to do is just compare or contrast the difference between zoning and subdivisions. And basically, zoning regulations have to do with the use of land. And subdivision regulations have to do with the division of land or the sale and division of land. And there's more to it than that, and if you go in and look at the century code uh, that I've got listed here for each of the cities, counties, and townships, what they have to say about zoning, these sections of the North Dakota century code actually provide the authority to your local jurisdictions to do planning and zoning. Um, I want to just point out for your information that uh, all three jurisdictions, cities, counties, and townships can do zoning, but uh, townships don't have the authority to do subdivision control. And it's an interesting twist in North Dakota Century Code law that uh, the, both counties and townships can do zoning of the same land. So if you have that kind of a situation occurring, you might say, well, how does that work? And a lot of people scratch their heads and, think, and you know, ask, well, why in the world are we doing it that way? But the thing I want you to just keep in mind is that townships actually have the control if uh, both zoning uh, are in place in the sense that if the township has a regulation that pertains to a particular issue, then its regulation is the one that matters whether or not it's more or less stringent than the county regulation. <coughs> Let's go back for a second and talk about one other thing I wanted to mention, the concept of a district. If you go in and read the North Dakota Century Code, it talks about a city or a county having the authority to do zoning. It will refer to uh, the ability to establish zoning districts. And essentially a zoning district is an area where you have established a certain set of uh, guidelines that pertain to how that land in that particular geography, that area, can be used. So, um, oftentimes, traditionally, a zoning district might be an agricultural zoning district for uh, areas that are supposed to be reserved for farming, and ranching, and similar and related uses. Or you might have a commercial area, which is intended to be where uh, most of your retail activities are taking place. Or a residential area, which is essentially supposed to 
be the place where uh, land is set aside for uses that are related to housing. And the idea is that within each district, you have to treat all the land the same. But you don't have to treat the land that's in a commercial district the same as the land that's in a residential or an agricultural district. So it's just a basic distinction that's a fundamental principle of what districts do. The Century Code also talks about a comprehensive plan. And if you go in and read it, it basically says that if you're going to do zoning, it has to be done, quote, in accordance with a comprehensive plan. And I'm not going to spend much time talking about them today, but in a nutshell, a plan is that blueprint for growth in your county or your community. Um, one of the chief benefits of it is it's, it's a way to make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of understanding what's expected or intended to happen for growth in your community. And that's a good thing. Uh, everybody likes certainty in order to make decisions for the long term. They can feel more comfortable with the investment that they may choose to make if they know uh, what the plan is. A comprehensive plan typically has maps. It will list goals and policies that are supposed to address how and what you want to see in your community or your county. And comprehensive plans aren't static. They're not intended to be done once every 20 years or, or so. The idea is that when your circumstances in your local jurisdiction change, then it may be time to update your comprehensive plan. So the question came up a couple days ago about whether or not you could do revisions to your zoning ordinance without updating your comprehensive plan. And the basic answer I gave then, uh, give again, is if what you want to do with your zoning ordinance is consistent with what your plan says, then you don't have to change the plan. But if your circumstances have changed, then you maybe want to take a look at changing the plan anyway. Another tool that's pretty important to think about, and you may already do this informally, is a capital improvements plan. Basically what you're doing is you're thinking about what are major investments need to be in your community or your county. You're recognizing you don't have the money to do them all at once, so you're prioritizing what you're going to spend, and spend your money on first. Uh, it's very useful to be thinking about that, not just in terms of what your top priority is, but whether or not there's a sequence that can, resent, uh, can result in the, the best long-term least cost uh, or investment. And it's also important to recognize that sometimes it makes more sense to do one or two projects at the same time because you can end up with the total cost savings. Annexation is something that often is an issue when you start to talk about uh, growth in your community. And I just want to spend just a tiny bit of time talking about that. Um, annexation is a process that has two ways to go about it under the North Dakota Century Code. And uh, one of them is by ordinance, the other is by... Uh, Resolution. Thank you. Who's my helper? It wasn't Rod, it was sitting right up here. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so those two approaches have some benefits uh, depending on what your, your situation is. And if you were paying attention to uh, Dickinson's news over the last year and a half, you, you kind of know the story better than I do, maybe. But ultimately, just I want you to be aware of the fact that you've got some choices there, and uh, some, sometimes you might want to choose one or the other in order to, uh, to uh, do things the cleanest way possible. Um, there's a whole section of the Century Code that deals with that as well. <clears throat> Extraterritorial authority is another term that's useful to talk about briefly. Uh, your city has a municipal boundary, and the area within that is uh, taxed by the city, uh, or at least the, the taxes uh, that are for the city go to the city if it's within that municipal boundary. However, outside of the extraterritorial, or excuse me, outside of the municipal boundaries, there is the ability for uh, a city to establish zoning and subdivision control through um, some of the regulations that the Century Court allows them to have. Um, basically, the rule is for a community with under 5,000 population, 
you can extend out a half mile and have complete control over the zoning or subdivision authority within that area. And you can, together with the county, have control over the next half mile. So there's a total of about a mile that you can control beyond your municipal boundary. Um, the illustration here is for Glen Ellen, and you can see that the blue area is for that unilateral control they have for the first half mile, and the purple is uh, for the second. There are some kind of funky rules about how you determine exactly what the area is. Uh, you have to draw an arc that's a half mile, and if more than 50% um, of the land is inside the arc, for every quarter quarter section of land, that whole quarter quarter goes in. And uh, if it's less than 50%, the whole quarter quarter stays out. You said 5,000 population. Is that less or more? If it's 5,000 or under. Or under. Yeah. Got half a <coughs> Couple, uh, Just a few other terms and decision processes I just want to alert you to or think, uh, just talk about briefly. Planning review is the process you use for subdivision control, and uh, it, it addresses not just how land should be divided, but it, it's also the time that your community should look at how it will be served by utilities, by roads, etc. And uh, there are oftentimes lengthy regulations written for exactly how that's accomplished, but um, just, just be mindful that that's a process that you should have as a part of your county or your city. And zoning amendments uh, take two forms, text amendments and map amendments. When it's a map amendment, it usually deals with a change to a zoning district boundary. Um, that oftentimes happens during growth where you have an uh, area that, for instance, has been zoned agricultural and then uh, there's growth happening and, and somebody wants to develop some of that agricultural zone land and it's not allowed. So they have to ask for a change in the zoning district to something that would allow it. Um, conditional uses, I think I, I wanted to highlight them just because I think they're a really useful tool for communities to keep in mind. Uh, imagine this situation. Uh, you've got a residential area in your town and uh, there's an area that's been sitting vacant for quite a while, and it's next to some existing housing. It's zoned residential. And uh, a developer comes along and says, you know, I think there's a market for multifamily housing here. So I want to put up an apartment building here. And you don't have any apartment buildings in the area, uh, but it seems like a good idea. It seems like it meet a need. So you're for the idea, but the more you think about it, the more you think about the proposal, you're recognizing that, well, they're going to put up 24 living units here, and they're not proposing very much parking. So that means the parking is going to spill over into the street, and it's going to spill over into the street in front of the, our neighbors. And where are they going to park when they have company, and so on. And there gets to be some questions that Although there's the upside of having the community have that apartment building, there may be a downside for the, the parking issue that comes with it. If you have the multifamily um, function or use in your zoning district for residential as a conditional use, it means that you're going to have to hold a hearing on it to consider what the impacts are, and then your community is going to have to decide okay, what do we need to do to protect those or address those potential impacts? And those kinds of things you can call conditions for approval. So when you actually end up with a, an approval of this um, apartment building, you may require that they put 50% uh, or 80% or 100% of their parking needs on the site of the, of the uh, of the lot or the development instead of having it depend on off street or excuse me off on street parking for it. One other term that I want to talk about briefly is variances. Um, a lot of times I see communities that use variances to do something that uh, well their regulations don't normally allow them to do. And I can't I'm not an attorney, I'm not gonna say whether or not that's appropriate, 
but I can tell you that in planning practice, it's not a good idea. The purpose of a variance is generally to provide the ability of a lot in a particular zoning district to be used the way all the rest of the property in that zoning district is to be used. So a variance isn't necessarily a good idea for a use. Um, because you don't want to be granting uses to one property that aren't a use that you would allow for every other property in that zoning district. When you think about making decisions in the planning and zoning world, uh, they, they fall into three general categories. The legislative category, the quasi-judicial category, and administrative. And basically, legislative function is really about making rules or policies. And uh, that would be something that would be what happens when you're actually creating your comprehensive plan and uh, establishing your zoning or your subdivision regulations. The quasi-judicial rule or, or function is, is more like what you do when you hold those conditional use hearings. There you're acting more like a court and you have to be more careful to make sure that the way you make the decisions uh, follows uh, somewhat court-like <laughs> procedures. And then the last function, the administrative function, is what's usually the role of the person who's helping staff the uh, planning functions, uh, typically a zoning administrator or somebody like that. And they're oftentimes making decisions uh, or judgments about what applies or doesn't apply according to the ordinance. Now finally, I want to talk just a little bit about some issues I think commonly come up. Um, first of all, in zoning, one of the fundamental things you want to make sure you're careful not to do is to make arbitrary or capricious decisions. You're looking for consistency. So uh, just keep that in mind as being a fundamental thing you want to make sure you are doing when you make those kinds of decisions. And then, like I mentioned in the beginning, record keeping is really important. You should, te you should keep careful minutes. Uh, personally, I think it's to your best interest to actually tape record your, your meetings so that you know exactly what got said, and you can refer back to them when you write the minutes. Um, keep in mind, that I mentioned this vaguely before, but uh, there are certain cir circumstances where the content of your decisions that show up in your minutes are the basis for what can be presented in a court of law as evidence to support the decision you've made if somebody wants to contest your decision. And then there's a term called ex parte communications, which is what I think we do all the time. We meet our neighbors and we talk about the issues, but when you have a decision that needs to be made uh, in a zoning or a subdivision control uh, context, you're going to be having a planning commission or a city council meeting or a county board of commissioners meeting about that topic. The place to talk about that, the place to present information that should be used in making those decisions is in that meeting. And talking about that with one of those decision makers outside that context is not a good idea. Uh, there could be lots of other things I could bring up, but I told you I was going to try and keep this uh, short and give you an opportunity to uh, ask me questions or ask us questions about what's on your mind. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over for you to question me. And if you have uh, those, um, if you don't want to speak up and you've got those cards and you want to hand in your questions, that'd be great. in terms of uh, administrative functions or regulations. Uh, if you have land that FEMA has designated to be in within a 100-year floodplain within your jurisdiction, whether it's a county or a city, you have the situation where you will end up having to 
participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. And as a local governing body participating in the National Flood Insurance Program, you basically promise that you will regulate the use of land within that 100-year floodplain. I'm oversimplifying things, but in a nutshell, that's the starting point to think about. So if you're a participant in the program, you need to make sure that you're following what they say you promised them at that time. And typically that includes a set of regulations that are not very long, not that complicated, but they get forgotten a lot. And uh, they include things like if there's a flood, a flood wave, which is the area that's supposed to be reserved for flood waters to run through the area, then that floodway should not have any development happening in it. Then there's the area outside the floodway that's still in the 100 year flood plain where development is allowed, but only if it's built to certain standards. So the local jurisdiction that makes that promise to regulate areas within the floodplain is responsible for doing that. Typically, you do it as part of your, your uh, um, planning and zoning procedures, because what happens, you're talking about development, if you have a zoning ordinance, uh, it's likely that you're going to the zoning administrator and saying, well, can I do this? And the zoning administrator should be thinking, oh, well, that's in a 100-year floodplain. In addition to our regular zoning regulations, you also have to meet the requirements of this special uh, floodplain regulation. And one other question. Have you ever run into a situation where there's no wetlands within that county? No. <laughs> Does that also have to be designated? Uh, FEMA doesn't uh, doesn't try to designate or require the management of wetlands or the uh, maintenance of wetlands. Okay, we have a question here. If both city and the county zone the same area, who has the last word on decisions or has the most authority? I'm going to back up to this one slide and kind of use that as a springboard for the answer. Um, because essentially a city and a county don't normally have the ability to do zoning of the same area. Within a city's municipal boundary, the county has no ability to zone. And uh, we can complicate things and talk about uh, joint powers agreements at another time. But in general, that's the way it is. If the uh, county has zoning, it doesn't apply inside the municipal boundary. Outside the municipal boundary, if a city chooses to establish extraterritorial zoning authority for that first half mile, they can do so without any regard to what the county says. In other words, the county doesn't have any say over what the, those rules are. Uh, they, they may have some comments they want to make, but I think it's fair to say that there's unilateral control there. For that second half mile, if the city chooses to establish extraterritorial authority that goes beyond the first half mile, they have to do so jointly with the county. And uh, in that case, you might this that might be what this question applies specifically to. If there's not agreement, there is no decision. And by default, the decision is no if there's an application. That's my understanding. I would advise you to uh, get a second opinion from an attorney because I'm not intending to practice law by giving you an answer to that question. Sir? To go back one, one step farther, the township has the authority, the original authority, right? The township has authority for zoning if they have established it. Uh, one thing that's sometimes not recognized is that you don't automatically have zoning authority. You actually have to establish zoning authority over a particular chunk of land before you can say you have authority over it. So townships may say, okay, we're writing this zoning ordinance and it's applying to our land within our uh, township. Well, that's true, except if there's a municipality that has some of the land within that township, because if that's the case, the township has no say about the land inside the municipal boundary, and by the same token, the township has no say over the land outside the municipal boundary if it's within the extraterritorial area. Uh, there was another hand raised nearby here. Well, I was just wondering how long those boundaries will exist. Um, with growth and everything, have to be fragmented in every direction? 
Just say it one more time. I'm going to show you how to cut your flavor. Your boundaries you drew around Glen Ellen. Yep. Okay. Let's say it expands. The city gets to that the, the first blue square. How? When do those boundaries change? Great, great question. Did you hear that? When do the boundaries change? If the city's municipal boundary changes, uh, sort of the corollary question is, does the extraterritorial boundary change automatically? And the answer is no. You have to, as a municipality, uh, take the formal procedure of expanding that extraterritorial area. And so if you expand your, let's just say in this case, if, uh, I suppose you said there was a red light. <coughs> Can you see the red dot? Okay, mm -hmm. so let's just say that Glen Allen grows oh, up this way. Okay? Right up, come on, we've got a new residential housing development right next to the golf course. Well, that means that instead of measuring with that half mile arc, you can see where it's already kind of uh, making that arc because this sticks out about that quarter line, or section line, I mean. Uh, if it was all the way up here, that arc would be more up in here. But you don't get the blue extension unless you pass an ordinance that says, okay, we are now taking authority over that area up in here. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, sir? Say you own the land in this particular area, your tax to go up then? both from agricultural to... Great question. Do your taxes change if the zoning changes? That's pretty much what you're saying, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a separate question from do your taxes change if you move from being in the township or the county to in the city? Uh, your taxes are going to be based on whether you're in the city or the county uh, accordingly. But with regard to the zoning change, taxing is based on the use of land and not on the zoning of the land. So. At, let's say you change from agricultural uh, uh, zone to a commercial zone. Until you start developing the land, you won't see the taxes change. Do you have any comments on uh, like road haul agreements with um, these companies? Two. Uh, first of all, I haven't done any detailed research into the legal ramifications, but years ago I worked for a county where gravel mining was a common practice. And the issues that got the most attention and the most negative attention were those applications for opening a new gravel mine. Uh, and the reason why was uh, the same kind of issue that Greg was talking about earlier today. Uh, gravel trucks are notorious for ignoring every rule you can think of. And it's the trucks, not the people driving them, that do that. <laughs> but in addition to that, uh, there's that side factor that if you're out in the country, most of those roads aren't paved roads. And so what do you get? Dust. Lots and lots of dust. So there's, there's safety issues, and, and, and then there's just the whole quality of life. I have heard so many times, <laughs> I spent my, and then pick a number out of your head, to buy this tract of land and move out in the country so that I can have a peaceful surrounding. And now, look what happened. You know, and, and some things you can control and some things you don't. In this case, the short <laughs> end of the story is that they, as a county, would determine exactly what haul roads could be used. Uh, so they would say, yes, this is a conditional use. We will allow you to open this gravel mining operation, but if you're going to do it, you're going to be on this road for this chunk of it, and then this road, and so on. They would also sometimes put limits on when the hauling could take place. Not 24 hours a day, but between dawn and dusk, or something like that. Uh, I think that that's a, a type of tool that you can use pretty broadly. Um, I, and whether or not you can charge a fee is something that I don't want to try and answer. Rod, have you have you investigated that question? We've got Rod Lamble with the uh, Roosevelt Custer Regional Authority here, so we're asking the question about the ability to charge a fee for a haul road. Okay, 
Sorry for putting you on the spot, but Raj has been out here for a long time and the issue has been around for a long time. So, Okay, any other questions? Did I get to the heart of your question, sir? Well, uh, what I was wondering is really, are they required to have a hall road agreement to use your road, or is that just kind of a common courtesy, or...? If they're on a public road, you can, uh, you can regulate, uh, you can set a condition like that, in my opinion. Um, again, uh, it might be wise to consult an attorney to try to make sure that you, uh, you've got the teeth behind the request you're going to make.